هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما جيب هذا السيد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so with Allah Ta'ala, I'm hoping that this halaqa is going to be educational, but at the same time it is going to be quite entertaining as well. Generally speaking, when we speak about love, we say that love is very blinding. And you're going to learn something today, that if you are blinded by love before marriage, marriage will be a severe eye-opener for you. A husband and wife, they're having a quarrel, they're having a fight. And she says, honey, I was so blinded, I was such a fool when I married you. And the husband says, you're right, I didn't notice. <laughs> Man, you guys are terrible. You guys need to pick up on my jokes. <laughs> That's like the fakest laugh ever. <laughs> okay, so let's get something off the bat right away. Speaking about happy marriages, a lot of people have this perception that they're going to get married and their marriage is going to be blissful and happy and calm and serene at all times. But the reality of the situation, that is not what defines a happy marriage. A happy marriage is not one that doesn't have fights and doesn't have quarrels. That's not what a happy marriage is. A happy marriage is a relationship where even during the fights, they find a, a way to remain humane and find a way to remain civil and find a way to get along. Because the nature of human relationships is that the longer you spend together, the more annoyed and frustrated you get with one another. This is just the way human beings are. And you can tell that when you've been on a long journey, even with your best friend on the planet, you know, after like 10, 12 hours of driving together, you're like, I need my space from you. You know, you go your way, I'll go do my thing. That's just the real, the, you know, the way human beings are. Now you can imagine, you're with the same human being for like 25, 30, 40, 50 years. You can imagine what it's gonna be like at that time. It's like, I need like three months away from you. And this is how, you know, it rebuilds that love. And this really, you know, it helped me understand something. If you look at, if you look in Islam, why does Islam give such a heavy emphasis for men praying in jama'ah, that going to the masjid and praying in congregation. That if you look at so many ahadith, the Messenger of Allah says, telling us that you know, the salah is multiplied 25 times, the salah is multiplied 27 times. The Messenger of Allah says, saying that you know, I would ask someone to give the adhan and then I would burn down the houses of the ones that go to, wouldn't go and pray in jama'ah. Like you look at these ahadith and it makes you wonder, you know, what is the, the, the great wisdom behind this? Now the general wisdom is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He obviously loves you know, people getting together and worshipping Him. That's the obvious reason. Number two is that it helps build bonds amongst the brothers. That brothers meet each other, you know, they get to, to get together, social activity, they interact with one another. That's the second wisdom. But the third wisdom is that if you're praying your salah five times a day at home, eventually you're going to get stuck. You know, you're going to get fed up, you're going to need a change. So Islam provided that change for you. That rather than going out and just merely socializing, come to the masjid where you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the men get to intermingle with the brothers, and then they go back to their home. And it creates that distance, and it creates that distance. And giving, you know, worth or substantiation to that paradigm where they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Meaning that if you spend a little bit of time away from your spouse, this will actually make you fonder of one another. Rather than a spouse that is always like together and literally attached to the hip, you know, give them a week and they'll be fed up of one another. Because that's just the, the way human beings work. So now, that having been said, let's move into our first topic of discussion. And that is understanding human needs. Understanding human needs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings with six main psychological needs. Six main psychological needs. And I need you guys to memorize this because this is the foundation of understanding your relationship with your spouse. This is the foundation of understanding your relationship with your spouse. So the first level you have, this is going to be a spectrum level number one. You have love and you have recognition. You have love and you have recognition. Speaking about love, this is the emotion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emotionally charged the woman with. Meaning that she is most motivated through this emotion and through this need of hers. 
And while men have this need as well, it is not as strong in them as it is inside of a woman. Then you have the other side of the spectrum, and this is certainty. And certainty is this human need that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created much, much stronger in men than they did in women. Now let's see how this comes out to play. Looking at men, you'll see that, you know, subhanAllah, it is such a great need that we come up with phrases that don't even make sense. So for example, you're playing on a sports team and this guy scores. How do you recognize him? You tell him you're the man. Now if you think about this statement, what does this statement actually mean? What is it a recognition of? Like, is it his gender? Is it his manliness? What is it? But it's just, again, a guy will feel good. You tell him, you're the man, you know, I'm recognizing that. It makes him feel good. So it shows you that how on the simplest of levels that man needs this recognition. Now this becomes very dangerous as well. Because you'll notice that once you start desiring recognition, then the concept of riya comes into play. That you're no longer doing things purely for the sake of Allah, but for the sake of building your ego. And that is why if you look at the hadith of who are the first three people who are to be thrown into the hellfire, even though, don't, even though it specifically doesn't say men, it is understood that the connotation is that of a man. Because it mentions the scholar, it mentions the martyr, and it mentions the philanthropist. Now the scholar, generally it is the man that's going to go out and study and be the leader of the community. The martyr, it is the man that is going to go out and fight for the sake of Allah and you know, he dies in that way. And number three, it is the philanthropist, the one that gives his wealth for the sake of Allah. Usually the man, again, that is going to go out and work, earn that money, and then, you know, again, his ego comes into play and he does it for the sake of other than Allah. And that is when Riya comes into play. So that's an important concept to understand. It is an important concept to understand that men are driven by recognition, Women are driven by love. And both of them come into play with each gender, but love is stronger in women and recognition is stronger in men. Level number two, level number two, is that you have that of adventure versus certainty. Adventure versus certainty. So by certainty, what do we mean? What we mean by certainty is that each night you will come home and you'll find your house in the same place. Your car will be parked in the same place. You have a certain order in your closet of where your suits, your shirts, your ties, your thobes and everything are in a certain order. All of this is certainty. And as human beings, you need a certain level of certainty in your life. Because without certainty, there's chaos and there's no stability in your life. Then on the exact opposite end is adventure. And this adventure is that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, it becomes redundant. A person gets fed up and they need change in their lives. And that is why you'll see the, that some of the people that suffer the worst forms of depression are people who work in cubicles. That there's no windows, I hope no one works in a cubicle here, <laughs> but there, you work in a cubicle. So you work in a cubicle, there's no sunlight, you're using the same desk, the same phone, the same computer, tap, typing in the same numbers, the same letters every single day. By the end of like 10 years of doing that, the person has gone mad. Because there's no sense of adventure, there's no sense of change. So human beings, they need a combination of the two. They need a certain level of certainty, but at the same time, they do need a certain level of adventure of, as well, where things are changing up. And then you have the third level or the third tier, where you have contribution and you have growth. Where you have contribution and you have growth. And this is another fundamental component of human psychology, where human beings have this need to contribute and they have this need to grow. So they're not on opposite ends of the spectrum, but these are just things that people need to do. So they need to feel as if they're contributing. So if you're having a group discussion and everyone is speaking except for one individual, that one individual, even though he may not have anything to say, he has this need inside him to speak and he may even end up saying something stupid just because he has the need to contribute. Human beings are like that. They will need to contribute into something. And then the, th the, the last thing, this is the sixth need that humans have, is that of growth. That means we can't always be staying at the same level. We need to be growing. We need, our horizons need to be expanding. We need to be learning new things. We need to have new experiences. And this is where growth comes into play. Now the reason why these six things are so important is because you'll notice in your relationship with your spouse, if you want to do like a self-diagnosis, why are things going wrong in my relationship? Why are things going wrong in my marriage? It will usually come down to one of these six things. The man is not being recognized. The woman doesn't feel there is love. There's either too much chaos in the relationship, not enough stability, or there's too much stability and there's not enough adventure. 
Then this last tier is that there's not enough growth, that the husband and wife, they're not growing as a couple, they're not learning things, learning things, they're not experiencing new things, and that's something that needs to be addressed. And then the last thing is that they're not contributing to society. They just feel as if they're a part of a community, but they don't have anything to give back. They don't have anything to offer. And then these are the six most fundamental needs that every human being will have. Now who's gonna repeat these six for me, inshallah? I need all six of them, with the exception of Ayyub. Exception of Ayyub. Go ahead. Love. Recognition, excellent. Go ahead, go ahead, help him out. Sorry, adventure, okay. What's the opposite of adventure? Certainty or stability, excellent. Now we move on to the last level. What's the last level? Contribution and what's the last one? Growth, excellent. So those are the six. You need to memorize these six, because I'm telling you, once it comes down to analyzing your relationship, the problem is going to lie in one of these six areas. You master these six areas, bidhillahi ta'ala, and it will solve all of your problems, bidhillahi ta'ala. With that having been said, so those are the human needs. Now let us get down to social behavior and social differences. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us something in the Quran. That a man is not like a woman. That when Maryam was born, you know, um, her father had made an oath that if I have a man, I'm going to dedicate him to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put him in the masjid. But now that Maryam was born, he couldn't do this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved this statement in the Quran. That the man is not like the woman. Meaning that there are key differences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created between a man and a woman. And we're going to explore some of those key differences bi'idhillahi ta'ala. The first one we're going to explore is the ability to speak and to orate and the words we speak. The average man will speak between 12,000 and 15,000 words per day. 12,000 to 15,000 words per day. Anyone want to take a guess how many words the average woman speaks? Infinity? No. <laughs> No, that's too high, man. Way too high. <laughs> Double it. Double is close. You're very, very close. Someone give me another answer. Three times? Even that's too much. Go ahead. 26,000? You're getting closer. So between 22,000 to 25,000 words. From 22,000 to 25,000 words, these are the average amount of words that come into play. Now, why is it important to know this? It's important for both men and women to know this. So a man comes home from work, he's dead tired, he's, you know, he's finished. He's been on the phone all day, he's been in meetings, he's been discussing things. He comes home, the wife says, Salaamu Alaikum honey, how are you? What is he going to say to his wife? It is a one word answer, either Alhamdulillah, fine, something along those lines. And the wife's going to think, you know, why is it only one word? You know, he should have 30,000 words for me. You know, that's the way he's supposed to speak to me. Now, the husband in his kind and generous nature, he says, you know what, let me reciprocate this question. She asked me how I'm doing. It's human nature, let me ask her how she's doing. So he says, honey, how have you been? Now before she starts to speak, she needs to take a deep breath. <gasps> and it's like, you know, she tells you about Khadija's day, Aisha's day, her parents, her neighbors, her, you know, extended relatives in like Bangladesh. You will hear the whole world's information in like literally 15 seconds. And then you're like, why, why, <laughs> you know? Why couldn't you just suffice with fine? Why couldn't you just be like me? And this is the first time you're noticing this key difference, that men have this limited amount of word usage. Meaning that once they get between 12 to 15,000 words, this is their comfort zone. Anything more than that, and it becomes burdensome upon them, because they have to start becoming someone that they're not. A woman, on the other hand, she has a capacity of 22 to 25,000 words. If she's not reaching that normal zone, then she's also going to be in a zone that is not comfortable for her. And this is something that you have to understand, that when your wife comes home, when your wife starts talking to you, and you just start thinking, why does she talk so much? You know, why does she always have to be talking? And then the wife thinks, you know what? My husband doesn't express himself to me. Why is he like this? He doesn't love me. That's what she starts thinking right away. The second you start answering with one letter, one, answer, one word answers, all of a sudden he doesn't love me enough. And this is the first difference you need to understand that that's not the case. 
It's not that your wife, you know, she loves annoying you, and it's not the same thing that your wife, your husband does not love you, that's why he's not speaking. But rather it's the recognition that Allah created both species differently. And that is why you have to accommodate for both. So if a man's had a very hectic and busy day when he's gone to work, he's going to come home, he's going to need to relax, need to rejuvenate, and then his cycle will slowly begin again. Same thing for the woman. If she stays home all the time, and she doesn't communicate with too many of her friends, you know, she doesn't have too much social interaction, you are going to be her source of, own inter of social interaction. And this is something you will have to bear. So this is like your very first lesson over here, that when a man comes home, he needs to be prepared to converse. Don't ever think that I will ever go home and I will have an opportunity just to sit quietly the rest of the night. It's unrealistic. Unless you're providing alternatives for your wife, that's not going to happen. And same thing for the wife, she needs to appreciate the fact that the husband has been out at work, he's had a very long day, he's used most of his words, and when it comes weekend time, you'll notice that he's more conversing. You'll notice that you know, after he's had his time to relax, he'll communicate better. So that is the first social difference. Second social difference is the way men and women deal with stress. The way men and women deal with stress. A man when he deals with stress, he goes into what they call into a cave. And meaning that when he has a problem in his life, he never starts talking about his problem right away. He doesn't start shedding tears. He doesn't, you know, need to go and call a helpline or anything like that. He just needs some time to himself. So he'll go into a corner of his house, he'll go into his bedroom, he'll need 20 to 30 minutes by himself, he'll come out, and then he will be normal again. A woman on the other hand, she deals with stress in a completely different manner. She needs to speak about that stress, and she needs her emotions validated. She needs her emotions validated. So now I want you to imagine a husband and wife, when they first get married, and there's stress inside the relationship, what does the man do? He wants to go into his cave, he wants to be isolated. The woman wants to speak about it, and she wants her emotions validated. Now when they don't know anything about another, and they don't realize that men and women deal with stress differently, the first time a woman is seen crying by her husband, what's he going to do? He's going to think that, you know what? Let me leave my wife alone. She needs some time by herself. She'll gather her thoughts, and then we can talk later. The wife sees this from her husband. She's like, what an inconsiderate fool. You know, he sees me crying and he doesn't even care. Again, he does not love me. That is a conclusion she's going to jump to. Then you look at the other opposite end, that the first time a husband has a stressful day and he comes home and he's really stressed out and the wife's like, hey honey, how are you today? You know, what did you do today? What did you eat? What did you speak about? And this is driving the husband mad. He's like, just leave me alone. I want to be by myself. And then he isolates himself. So you notice the difference in experience over here. You notice the difference in experience over here. And both of them have to accommodate appropriately. So when a man sees a woman is distressed, he needs to do two things. He needs to do two things. His first initial reaction might be, you know what, let me leave her alone. Let, me de let her deal with her thoughts. That's a wrong answer right there. You need to go and validate her feelings. Let her know that everything is going to be all right and just console her. The second thing a man will try to do is that when a woman is upset, he'll be like, okay, let me hear your problem and I will offer you a solution. Anyone who is married over here will know that the wife couldn't care less about your solution. She does not care about your solution. She just wants her emotions validated. She wants to know that she has the right to be upset and that you're not judging her for being upset and that you will still love her even though she is upset. So number one, don't leave her by herself. And number two, as a man, you don't want to offer a solution right off the bat. But rather you just want to hear her out and you just want to validate her experiences. From a husband's perspective is that when the husband is seen distressed and distraught, the wife should give him his space, let him deal with his stuff. 20 to 30 minutes later, he will be back to normal and you can discuss the problem, you can discuss the issue and he will be up for it. But if you try to force it out of him from the very get-go, that just creates further friction and creates further problems. Social difference number three, the way men and women nod their heads. Now you'll notice that in Desi culture, mashallah, we like nod our heads for everything, like tick, 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 tick. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm referring to right now is that when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one another, how do you show agreement? How do you show agreement? You gently, you know, nod your head, you you will affirm that you know, you're listening and paying attention. Men and women use this completely differently. Men and women use this completely differently. 
So a woman, when she's speaking with another woman, the woman in front of her will constantly be just nodding her head just to show that she is paying attention. That is what a woman does when she's nodding her head in another conversation. It's not showing that she agrees. It's just showing the fact that she is paying attention. From a man's perspective, when he nods his head, he is not showing with this nodding of the head that he is paying attention, but rather he's showing with it, he agrees with what you are saying. He agrees with what you are saying. So now when you have a man and a woman who have two different social experiences, that when a woman is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, she wants someone to show that, look, I'm, a paying, I'm paying attention to what you're saying. Whereas a man, he's only accustomed to nodding his head when he agrees with that fact. And every married man can testify to this statement that at one point or another in your life, a point will come where the wife will say, repeat everything I just said, because I don't think you're paying attention to me. Why is she saying this statement? You're obviously always paying attention. She's saying this statement because you're not nodding your head. Because for her, in order for her to recognize that you're paying attention, that nodding of the head needs to be there. Whereas for a man, you're only accustomed to nodding your head when you agree with something. So this will be like another fine point of action that when you're speaking with your wife, the way that you show that you're paying attention to her is just something simple by nodding your head and by saying, yes, I'm listening or affirm affirmative words like this. But when you just sit there like a zombie and you're like, and then you only shake your head when you agree with something, you have to understand that your wife isn't going to understand what that means. You know, why are you only nodding your head sometimes? Do you zone in, zone in and out of this conversation? Is that what's happening? So that's from a woman's perspective. From a man's perspective, he needs to appreciate this well. So he'll come home one day and he's like, honey, you know what? You're such an amazing cook. I want you to cook for the whole community. And the wife's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you know what? You clean the clothes really well. So I want you to clean my clothes, my brother's clothes, my dad's clothes, and you know that neighbor down the street, I want you to clean his clothes as well. And she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you know what? The bathroom upstairs needs to be cleaned, the basement needs to be cleaned, and you know what? I want a massage tonight. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the wife's like, wow, this is amazing. She's agreeing to everything. And then so we find asked her, so do you agree with everything? And she's like, not a chance. And the man's like, what went wrong? Because he's thinking that when she's nodding her head in affirmation, that she's agreeing with everything. But in reality, that's not what she's doing. She is just showing that I'm paying attention to what you're saying, and I will nod my head whether I agree with you or not. It's just to show that there's affirmation. So that is the third social difference. The fourth social difference. Now, some of these are not as important. Some of these are not as important. But the fourth social difference. The way we communicate with one another. The way we communicate with one another. So I want you to think about a marriage that you went to. A marriage that you went to. You have eight guys sitting on the table and you have eight women sitting on the table. How do you think they're going to be talking? How do you think they're going to be talking? The eight men on the table, it will be one person at a time and each person will have their turn. The second you have two people talking, one person is going to get annoyed and frustrated and he's going to be like, either you talk or you talk. Both of you can't talk at the same time. Because that's just not the way we communicate with one another. Everyone has their turn. You go to a woman's table and all of a sudden it's completely different. Eight people is divided down to four different conversations and that woman is listening into four different conversations. So she's like, oh, I really love your shoes. Oh, you guys went camping? When did you guys go camping? Hey, what, that's well, nice to hear. You know, you had a child, congratulations. And it's like simultaneous conversation. And the woman is able to keep up with this. Now this is not to say, like when I mention these things, they sound funny to us as men, and it's not to, to put women down. It's again to show this concept of laysa dhakaru kal untha, that the man is not like the woman. Allah created us differently. Now what is the lesson that you learn from over here? That when the lesson that you derive from men speaking differently and women speaking differently, that a man turn by turn, one by one, and you can't have more than two people, one person speaking at a time. As opposed to women, where they will have multiple conversations on a table and they're able to listen to each and every one. The lesson you derive from this is that men are goal-oriented and women are experience-oriented. What does this mean? That when it comes to performing tasks, a man will not be able to work on more than one task at a time. If he tries to do more than one task at a time, he may think he will be able to do it, but it takes away from his efficiency. He will be most efficient when he's working at one task at a time. A woman, on the other hand, she is able to complete multiple things at one time, whether there is 10 or whether there is one, it doesn't make a difference to her. 
And that is why you'll see that, you know, one of the worst things that you can do for a man is just leave him with the kids and leave him some tasks to do. So when a woman wants to torture her husband, what does she do? She says, honey, I'm going out of the house. I'm leaving you with the kids. Salaamu Alaikum. She leaves the house. Oh, and by the way, you have to answer that my friend's going to call, take a message from her. I want you to record this TV show. The diapers need to be changed. There's pizza in the oven for us. And you need to boil pasta for the kids. These are the instructions she leaves you. The wife comes home now. There's dirty diapers everywhere. The pizza is burnt. Um, you know, the, the pasta never got cooked. The TV show is on right now, but it's not being recorded. And the wife asks the husband, you know, what happened? And she's like, oh, your friend called and answered the phone. <laughs> you know, that's what he ended up doing. He's unable to multitask. Then the wife comes home and she takes care of everything. She starts cooking right away. With one leg, she's closing the, the oven door. With the other hand, she's stirring the pizza. With her head, she's holding the phone, talking to her friend. With one eye, she's watching the TV show. The other eye, she's watching the kid. And this is like the, the ability that Allah gave to a woman in terms of multitasking. And this is the, you know, the, the, the blessed nature that she has. Because she has so many tasks she has to take care of. Allah gave her the ability to do them at, many, at more than one at one time. Men on the other hand, they're one task after another. And this becomes a very valuable lesson, particularly for the sisters. That one of the most annoying things they do to men is that they will give a man a task just as he's leaving the house. So literally he has his jacket on, he has his hat on, one foot is out the door and she will be like, honey, don't forget the milk or honey, don't forget the diapers. Now the man will get so annoyed and so frustrated and the woman won't be able to understand why. She's like, it's such a simple task, why can't you just do it? And the man in his mind, he doesn't care about the task. It's the fact that you waited till the very last second and you've become a hindrance in him achieving his other goal. Because him leaving the house right now, he already has a goal in mind. He already has a goal in mind and you are becoming a hindrance in him fulfilling that goal. You're becoming a hindrance in him fulfilling that goal. So whenever you want a man to do something, communicate everything well in advance and you'll notice that those small arguments that will take place at the door, they'll be avoided. Because there's no longer a hindrance between a man and his goal. And then from a man's perspective, you learn to become more appreciative of your wife's talents. That Allah has blessed her with the ability to multitask and don't think that you know, you can only give her one task at a time or can only communicate with her one task at a time or think that, you know, she's not paying attention to you when you're speaking to her. That's not the case. Allah has blessed her to multitask at the same time. I'm thinking about if I should mention the last... Actually, I'll, I'll, miss, I'll skip the last one. You can study more social differences on, by yourself, but this is just an introduction to understanding that. Uh, just an introduction to understanding social differences between the man and the woman. Now we get into the topic of intimacy. We get into the topic of intimacy. And I had given this forewarning that, you know, we shouldn't have kids under 12, but obviously not everyone listened. So you are, you know, dealing with your own, I guess we reap what we sow. That's what I'm trying to say. It's your fault. It's your problem now. <laughs> intimacy. Intimacy is a huge part of marital relationships. And this is what you need to understand is that Islam came as a balance between all the different systems and cultures that exist. So you will have one culture and one system that will say, you know what? Man needs to stay celibate at all times and he should not get married, should not have marital relationships. And that is where, you know, they are. Then you have an extreme opposite culture, which is without any guidelines, without any boundaries, go and sleep with whoever you want, fulfill your desire in any way that you want. And that is completely fine as well. And both of these are extremely wrong. The first one is wrong is because it is not conducive to the nature of man. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this urge, created this desire that clearly needs to be fulfilled. And when it's not fulfilled, that is when perversion takes place. That is when perversion takes place. Then you have the exact opposite end of the spectrum where you have ultimate freedom and ultimate, you know, non, you're not questionable or answerable to anyone then you will notice that this becomes a spread of fawahish, a spread of disease, a spread of illegitimate children, a spread of a whole bunch of other problems. And then Islam comes with the middle path in trying to create a balance between the desires and needs of a human being and at the same time, a person being responsible as well. A person being responsible as well. So now, from an intimacy, an intimacy point of view, as you can see, it's not very easy to speak to in public about this matter. 
Speaking from an intimacy point of view, there are a couple of guidelines that you need to understand. There are a couple of guidelines that you need to understand. And this is from both perspectives. So first, let us talk about what is halal and what is haram. The general script, the general point, the general rule when it comes to intimacy is that everything is halal until proven haram. Everything is halal until proven haram. And then you look into the sharia, what are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited? What are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited? And you have three, actually four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly prohibited. Four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly prohibited. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy through the anus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy through the anus. Number two is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy when a woman is in her menstrual cycle. When a woman is in her menstrual cycle, and this takes the same ruling when she has postpartum bleeding. Meaning after she has a child, during that time, it is not permissible to be physically intimate with her at that time as well. The third thing that is prohibited in Islam is for one to be, um, you know, use that which is filthy, to use that which is disliked. Now, we'll get to this concept later on with the Ta'ala, but just understand the general rule. Because over here, Islam didn't come to give specifics, but Islam just gave general guidelines. And then the fourth principle, and the fourth rule you should know when it comes to intimacy, is that Islam prohibits people being wasteful. Islam prohibits people being wasteful. Now, a lot of the uncles and aunties, they may be thinking, what on earth is going on over here? I'm going to explain briefly and in, uh, in as clean of a way as I possibly can be in the light ta'ala. So the general guidelines is that everything is halal until proven haram. And those are the four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. So the first thing we mentioned is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made uh, intimacy through the anus clearly haram. And in fact, this is something that there's consensus on, that there's no disagreement upon, that this is prohibited. This is prohibited and is not allowed. And the same thing applies to the second one as well, that during menstruation and during uh, postpartum bleeding, it is not permissible to have marital relations at that time. And I want to make that very clear. That a husband and wife, they can be intimate in the sense that they can hold hands, they can kiss one another, they can enjoy one another in every single way, except for having marital relations. Except for having marital relations. That is what applies to the first two. They can enjoy one another in every way, except for having marital relations at that time. Then number three, we said, a person should not be filthy. A person should not be filthy. What does this general guideline mean? This general guideline means it encompasses two main things. Number one is the way that we speak with one another. So for example, living in our culture, there's this culture of you know, being very vulgar while having marital relations. That is not allowed in Islam. You know, to use bad words and to curse, even when a person is having marital relations with his wife, this is not the way that they should be. But rather there's a level of humanity and a level of dignity that needs to be retained. And this is something that, you know, is left for the non-Muslims and has nothing to do with Islam. And you'll notice that, you know, you'll come to see this, that this is like one of the diseases of like watching pornography is that you start developing cultures of intimacy that are not allowed in Islam. And then you view it so many times that a person starts to think that, you know what, this is the way marital intimacy is meant to be. This is the way that marital intimacy is meant to be. Related to this third point, uh, uh, this third principle as well, is that one should not be filthy. So you will notice that again, in Western culture, they'll use a whole bunch of products that are not, for the lack of, you know, better words, hygienic. They, they're, they're things that are, are not hygienic. I'm not going to educate you about them if you don't know what they are. If you know what they are, you know, seek refuge from Allah that you never find uh, someone who wants these sort of things. So those are the sort of things you have to avoid. Then the fourth thing is that you're not meant to be wasteful. That you're not meant to be wasteful. And this is something that, you know, you'll find in the books of old. That certain things that you're allowed to use in intimacy, certain things that you're not allowed to be, use in intimacy. So the question arises, are you allowed using food while being intimate? Are you allowed using food while being intimate? 
And the answer to this is yes, as long as you're, allow, as long as you're consuming that food. So for example, you know, I'm going to throw out names of foods, you figure out what to do with them. So when you talk about like chocolate sauce, you talk about whipped cream, you talk about you know, those sort of things, these are things that you're allowed to use. These are things that you're allowed to use. But at the same time, a person should not be wasteful. A person should not just use these things and then throw these things away. But rather, you're meant to consume them and not be wasteful. Now those are general guidelines. Those are general guidelines. Now why do I mention these sort of things? That as Muslims, there needs to be a safe space. You know, you'll notice that when a, a person will have a question, they're not going to feel comfortable to speak to the Imam. They're not going to want to speak to the brother that they see in the masjid. There needs to be a safe space. And one thing we definitely don't want is, you know, people going to the internet and trying to research, you know, should I be using this or should I not be using that? They don't have a, a, the level of morality and ethics that a Muslim is required to have. So I want to give you general guidelines in terms of what is allowed and what isn't allowed. And the reason why I bring this up again is because one of the biggest levels of frustration is because of this improper intimacy. That you know, the parents, they got the, the, the children married, they're like, Beta, Betty, you're now officially married, go figure things out yourself. The man who's never, the boy who's never had a boyfriend, girl has never had, uh, sorry, the boy has never had a girlfriend, <laughs> and the girl, the boy has never had a girlfriend, and the girl has never had a boyfriend, she's like, what do we do now? And then try reading these books by like Ibn Hazm and some of the scholars of the past, and they're like, what on earth is this? It seems like mechanics or something. And it's very difficult. And that's why this needs to be discussed with our up and coming you know, teenagers and young adults that are getting married in a halal and in a mature manner. So those are the guidelines. Now in terms of actual intimacy itself, I want to explain the difference between intimacy between a man and a woman. From a man, if we understand what we said about him, he is very goal oriented, right? He's very goal oriented, whereas a woman is very experience oriented. So for a man, it's about doing the task and finishing the task, and that is what will give him the greatest amount of pleasure, and he will be done. Whereas for a woman's perspective, it's not about completion, but rather it's about the experience itself. And this is what I want to share, you know, a very important difference over here. That there will be for a husband and wife, when, when they get married, there will be a time where a man will need to fulfill his urge. A man will need to fulfill his urge, and a woman will be like, you know what, let us go out for dinner first. Let us light some candles. Let us, you know, put on some nasheeds. And the man is like, that is, on the inside, he's being, like on the outside, he's being polite. But on the inside, he's like, this is not what I need right now. You know, I've just gone through some major fitna, something happened, and I need to fulfill my urge. A woman needs to recognize that, that at that time, he's not in the mood for an intimate experience. He just needs to fulfill his urge. At the same time, from a man's perspective, he cannot be greedy and selfish and think that this is the way intimacy is always going to be. There's a time to take, but there's also a time to give. So from time to time, yes, you will have to fulfill your urges, but at the same time, you'll want to make sure that you're giving back to your spouse as well. You'll want to make sure that you're giving back to your spouse as well. And this is something that you will learn to discuss with one another, experience with one another, and grow with one another. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of communicating over here. That a lot of times, you know, a husband and wife, they'll be having problems in their intimacy, but they're like, you know what? It's going to stay in the dark. We're not going to discuss it. We're not going to do anything about it. We'll just continue living as it is. But a breaking point eventually comes and nothing gets solved and the relationship eventually breaks down. So it's very important that a husband and wife, they, they, they agree amongst themselves that you know what? We may not know anything about intimacy coming into the marriage, but now that we're married, Allah has made us halal for one another. Let us enjoy this experience. Let us enjoy this experience and let us learn about it as well. So if there's something that you like, tell your spouse about it. If there's something that you dislike, tell your spouse about it. Rather than holding those feelings inside and repressing those emotions, deal with them up front and it makes things a lot easier. Rather than leaving your spouse to guess, to you know, what does my spouse like, what does my spouse not dislike, you know, be open about it, be frank about it, but be, you know, ethical and moral about it as well, that there's no need for vulgar descriptions and be, you know, sane and humane and speak about it in a mature manner. Alhamdulillah, the difficult part is done. I can wipe off the sweat. Now we get into the concept of public intimacy. Public intimacy. Are we allowed to hold hands in public? Are you allowed kissing your spouse in public? What is allowed, what is not allowed? The general rule for public intimacy has been that whatever is acceptable in the culture is acceptable by Islam. They, what they call the urf. 
Now obviously living in the West, that is not applicable at all. Because in our culture, you can go ahead and do whatever you want and no one will care. So from, our, from an Islamic perspective, we have a, a bit of a difficulty defining what is permissible and what is not permissible. But what I can tell you is what is safe and what is not safe. So in terms of holding hands in public, I believe this is perfectly fine and perfectly normal. This is perfectly you know, on the safe side. Showing affection in terms of kissing, a kiss on the cheek may be acceptable in some cultures, but in public, I would even feel uncomfortable doing something like that. So I would say go as far as holding hands, everything other than that, use your judgment, use your judgment. So if a husband has just come back from a long journey, the wife is picking him up at the airport, yes, it may be acceptable to give a hug and to give a kiss on the cheek, but if it's on, on a daily occurrence that they're going out for dinner or a weekly occurrence they're going out for dinner, there's like, you know, hugging and uh, ki uh, kissing on the cheek, that may be going a bit far. So you'll want to use your own judgment. But in terms of holding hands in public, I don't see anything wrong with that. Allah has made this halal and it's actually something which is permissible to do. It is a way of showing affection for one another. They say when a man holds his wife's hand, you know, in the honeymoon phase in like the first six months, you can tell it's because the husband and wife are happy with one another. Once that honeymoon phase is over, it usually becomes self-defense. Man, you guys are killing me. <laughs> okay, so that is public intimacy. Now we get to actual conflict resolution. The first thing you will want to understand is this very important principle that in a marriage, in a marriage, there should only be one person that is angry at a time. In a marriage, there should only be one person that is angry at a time. Meaning that when that conflict takes place, when those problems arise, you need to make it a principle in your marriage that only one person will get angry at a time. And the time will never come where both parties are actually angry with one another. And here's another bad joke for you guys. So they say that the first year of marriage, the man speaks and the wife listens. The second year of marriage, the wife speaks and the man listens. The third year of marriage, the man and the wife speaks and the neighbors listen. That's something you want to avoid. So that, mashallah, you guys are finally laughing. <laughs> okay, so that's something you want to establish from the very get-go. That no matter what happens in the marriage relationship, only one person will be angry at a time. Only one person will be angry at a time. So you notice that the husband is angry, the wife needs to restrain herself and say, you know what, let my husband be angry and he'll let his have his turn and I'm going to remain calm. Same thing with the husband, that when the wife is angry first, he should be, you know what, this is my wife's right to be angry. I'm going to let her be angry, let her express herself, and I'm not going to get angry. So you have to establish this as a rule in your family. Now in terms of actually dealing with anger itself, in terms of actually dealing with anger itself, here are five things that you need to know. That when an individual gets angry, he should seek refuge in Allah from a shaitan. He should say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim because it is shaitan that is causing him to get angry. Number two, is that he should go and make wudu. He should go and make wudu. This will help him cool down and it will help him change his physiology. Number three, is that in the case a person cannot go and make wudu, they should change their physiology. So the person that is standing, he should sit down. The person that is sitting down, he should lay down. And you'll see that when your person is laying down, that is the most difficult time to get angry. You'll almost never ever see anyone get angry while they're laying down. Because that posture is not conducive to blood circulation. And blood circulation is needed for an individual to get angry. So you'll notice that if you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lay down. And bidin lahi ta'ala, that will you know, help you calm down. The last thing is that always leave the room that you're angry in. Always leave the room that you got angry in. So husband and wife have had a fight it's part ways. The one that is angry should leave the room that he is angry in. And this is just a change in physiology, a change in setting will help him calm down, help him reflect, help him cool down, and then they can come back and discuss this matter. And this is a particular point for the brothers. This is a particular point for the brothers. In every marriage, you will have, sorry, in every marriage, these arguments will take place. And when these arguments take place, there will always be someone that is right, and then there will be you, the husband. <laughs> I don't know why. Why are you guys not enjoying my jokes today? <laughs> okay. So, and I'll give you another one as well. You know, from a, a man's perspective, or actually from a woman's perspective, she's always going to have the last word. She's always going to have the last word. And if a man ever thinks he's had the last word, 
That's usually because a second conversation began and he didn't realize it. <laughs> now let us conclude. We'll open up the floor for Q&A. Let us conclude with the example of the Prophet wasallam. Let us conclude with the example of the Prophet wasallam. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he has a chapter inside Sahih al-Bukhari called the anger of women. It's called the anger of women. Now when a person looks at this chapter heading, a person would assume, you know what, what a chauvinistic title, you know, showing the emotional woman again. But if you look at the actual nature of this hadith, it has very little to do with the anger of women, but has more to do with the akhlaq of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa with his wife. So you look at the, the hadith that Imam al-Bukhari brings under this chapter, it is the hadith where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he summons his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. And the first thing you, that you, is brought to your attention is how he summons her. So rather than saying, Aisha come here, he says, oh Aish, come here. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that Aish was a nickname that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for her. It was a nickname that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for her that was a term of endearment, a term of loving. And this shows us that when you address your spouse, don't address them just by you know, a first name basis. Don't just call them you know, Fatima or you know, Khadija or whatever her name may be, but call her by a term of endearment. Call her you know, my love, my you know, honey, whatever it may be. Call her by a term of endearment. Number two is that as this hadith continues, after he has summoned her, he says, Oh Aish, I know when you're angry with me, and I know when you're happy with me. So this shows us a second important lesson, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is initiating conversation with his wife. Meaning that the wife has this need to converse, this need to be loved, and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is now initiating it himself. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, Ya Rasulullah, how am I when I'm angry? And how am I when I'm, how, how am I when I'm happy? How am I when I'm angry? And how am I when I'm happy? The Messenger of Allah وسلم, goes on to say, O oh Aish, when you're angry, you say by the Lord of Ibrahim, such and such will happen. By the Lord of Ibrahim, you will do such and such. And when you are happy, you say by the Lord of Muhammad, such and such will happen. And by the Lord of Muhammad وسلم, you will do such and such. Here's an important lesson now for the sisters. Here it shows us that a woman is allowed to be upset, but within the parameters and guidelines of Islam. Meaning that she doesn't become vulgar, she doesn't start throwing things around, but rather she stays within the halal parameters, that here she shows her discontentness with the Messenger of Allah, even though he is the Messenger of Allah, but she shows her discontent as him as a husband, by doing what? She swears by the Lord of Ibrahim, rather than the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The hadith continues on, go on to say, and this is like the conclusion of the hadith. Now the lesson, again, before we get to the conclusion from a man's perspective over here, is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being the busiest of people, you know, the general of the army, the mayor of the community, the family counselor, the guidance counselor, the imam of the masjid, you know, listening to everyone's issues, taking care of the Baytul Mal, all of these things are happening. Yet the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam still found the time to appreciate the emotions of his wife. To tell her that, look, not only do I listen to your words, because he says the Lord of Ibrahim and the Lord of Muhammad, he's heard those words, he's accepted those words. But he also pays attention to the emotions. He also pays attention to the emotions. And this is like the crux of all of the lessons. That as a man, if you want to see how good of a husband you are, how manly of a man you are, then look at your ability to read the emotions of your wife. Look at your ability to read the emotions of your wife. So that when your wife says fine, does she actually mean fine? When she says all right, does she actually mean all right? What is she trying to say through her words? You should be able to read the emotion that is behind it because that is what you need, really need to figure out. Because you'll come to see in marriage, the words a woman uses are actually useless and futile. Because when she is angry, she'll use a whole bunch of words that mean the exact opposite. So she'll be like, yeah, go time with your friends. She doesn't mean that. She actually wants you to stay home and cuddle with her. That's what she wants. Now the conclusion of the hadith. The conclusion of the hadith. Again, proving our point that a woman will always have the last word. Especially Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, a very intelligent, you know, very clever woman. How does this hadith conclude? She says, Ya Rasulullah, even though the words changed on my tongue, my love for you stayed in my heart. My love for you stayed in my heart. And this shows us again that in that moment of anger, in that moment of heat, people will say things that they don't mean. 
things that may even that they may even regret. But at the end of the day, your relationship is built upon love. It is built upon mercy. Because this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it. That He is the one that created love and mercy amongst you. He is the one that created love and mercy amongst you. So that is the basis of your relationship. You need to recognize this and build upon that relationship. And this is what Aisha radiallahu anha is telling him. That yes, even though I may get angry and I may say things that may upset you, at the end of the day, I did that while in a state of anger and not because I hated you. I did that in a state of anger and not because I hated you. And this is something that you need to understand as a husband and wife as well. That in the moment of anger, the husband may say things he doesn't mean. The wife may say things he doesn't mean. But once everything has cooled down and calmed down, you need to express that love for one another again. And there is one last thing I wanted to mention, and I'll mention it now. But you've heard the example of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want to conclude with the experience of shopping. The experience of shopping. This is something I want to mention earlier on. That when we talk about shopping between a husband and wife, the experiences are completely different. So a wife will tell her husband that, honey, I need to go buy a new pair of shoes. So if husband's like, fine, you know what? On Saturday, we're going to go to the mall. We're going to go buy some shoes. So the husband, he plans out the trip to the mall. We're going to plan, you know, park at this gate, the closest gate to the shoe store. There are three stores inside, there's three shoe stores inside of the mall. He's mapped it out, one's on level one and two are on level two. The shortest route, he's planned it out and he's good to go. They get there to the shopping mall, they park the car, they walk inside the mall. Lo and behold, the wife sees a dress. She's like, honey, let's look at the dresses. She sees the linens, honey, let's go look at the linens. She sees the candles, honey, let's go look at the candles. She sees some perfume, honey, let's go and see some perfume. Eventually, two hours later, they finally get to the shoe store. She tries on a couple of pairs of shoes. This is nice, I'm not sure if I want it. Let's try on the next one. She'll try 15 pairs of shoes. An hour goes by, they've gone through the whole mall. They haven't bought any shoes and they're ready to leave the mall. The wife has this gigantic smile on her face as if she's on top of this world. The husband is ready to punch his car <laughs> and he's like, what on earth did we just go through? What went wrong? What was the difference over here? Again, if you go back to our example of man wanting fulfillment of goal and woman looking after experience, the man's goal for going shopping was purely just about buying the shoe. And he would only attain satisfaction if the shoe was bought. So the man, when he didn't buy the shoe, he considered himself, you know what, I didn't fulfill my goal. This is like a type of failure, it's a type of my shortcoming. And he actually feels angry and upset. Added to all of that is that we had all of these pit stops along the way that were a hindrance to fulfilling my goal. That made it even diff more difficult for me to fulfill my goal. That's what's happening in his mind. From a woman's perspective, her ultimate goal was not to buy the shoes. Remember, pay attention to the emotions, not the words. Her ultimate goal was not to buy the shoes. It was to spend quality time with her husband doing the things that she wants to do. She got to try on some dresses. She got to try on some perfumes. She saw the linens and the curtains. She went uh, you know, and maybe had a nice meal with her husband. And now she's on her way home. What more could she want? She has that emotional fulfillment. And that is why, again, pay attention to you know, goal orientation versus experience orientation. So that if you, a, man, a woman notices her man is upset, it's usually because his goal was not fulfilled and that is why he's upset. From a woman's perspective, she wants the experience and does not necessarily fulfill, uh, cared, does not necessarily care, uh, care about you know, the object being fulfilled or not, or the goal being fulfilled or not. She's just worried about the experience. Now what I want to conclude with is some books. What I want to conclude with is some books. That you know, marriage is a long-term process. Marriage is a very long-term process and it is and a, a lifetime of just learning about the opposite gender, more specifically your wife. And you know, you may think that you have studied psychology, you've studied anatomy, you've studied biology, you've studied all of these sciences, yet at the end of the day, you still can't figure out your spouse. So I wanna share with you some basic books that within Allah Ta'ala will help you do that. So the first is like a, a three set series. So I want you to familiarize yourself with the author's name and within Allah Ta'ala, you can look them up. They are Barbara and Alan Peace. They are Barbara and Alan Peace. And this is a three volume set. The first one is called Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maps. Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maps. The second one is called Why Men Don't Have a Clue and Women Always Need More Shoes. Why Men Don't Have a Clue and Women Always Need More Shoes. And this is on the topic of intimacy itself. 
Um, I'll tell you the name of the book and then you can, I'll explain something about it. Why men want sex and women need love. Why men want sex and women need love. The important thing to understand about this three volume set is that the authors of this book are atheists. They clearly mention that they are atheists. So they're not even like any form of like practicing Christians. They're just completely atheist. So they don't have any concept of morality, any concept of ethics. And there are clearly some, you know, un-Islamic concepts in this, in, the, in this set of books. So you'll want to focus that, you know, you try to filter out all of the un-Islamic stuff through the guidelines that you learned today and take all the applicable, permissible Islamic stuff from it to be in the Ta'ala. Then the next book is probably one, perhaps one of the most important books if you're in a marriage right now that is going through a lot of problems. Constant fighting, constant argumentation, you know, constant of wanting to be away from your spouse. It's called The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by Dr. John Gottman, by Dr. John Gottman. And this in actuality, when I do my counseling services, a lot of the principles that I use are based upon this book. Now you'll find, subhanAllah, these are things that you'll find in the seerah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The way the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with his spouses, a lot of these concepts are taken from that, except that it's not mentioned. So what would be really interesting and cool is that someone who's like specialized in the seerah, they read this book, take the principles, and then give like prophetic examples for the Muslims, so you can like Islamicize a book like this. Then, this is the last book I'll mention over here. It's called The Five Languages of Love. The five, uh, the five love languages. The circuit to love that lasts. And this is by Gary Chapman. This is by Gary Chapman. And this is again understanding the concept of love. That how does one increase love in marriage? And then how does build one build upon that? And what are the things that actually break love down? That meaning through the presence of these things, love will not last. So these are some books that I would definitely recommend that if you're newly married or you're about to get married, get these books so that you start off your marriage on the right track bi Allah ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We'll open up the floor for questions and answers. We'll take five questions bi Allah ta'ala. If anyone is man enough to ask the questions, inshaAllah. Go ahead. Okay, the brother's question is, are there any Muslim books on this? I want to share my experience with you that, you know, naturally when I came back from Medina, I had this vision in mind that I would teach fiqh and aqidah day and night. That I just want to sit in the masjid and teach the people fiqh and aqidah. So I start up fiqh and aqidah classes, no one comes to them. But the second, you know, people do start coming to the masjid, they're like, you know, I divorced my wife accidentally, I was angry, oh, I'm not happy in my marriage. And all of a sudden, this is like where my focus is going to. But at Medina, you know, we learned the fiqh of it, we didn't learn the psychology behind it. So that's when I started, slowly started learning it. And then I met this fantastic brother. Most of you know him as Baba Ali. Baba Ali is, mashallah, a, a top-notch brother. He has this project that he runs called Half Our Deen, uh, which is like helping people get married. But part of the experience of helping people get married is teaching them, you know, the differences between men and women and how, to become, how they're compatible and how they're not compatible. And I was actually on a, a flight with him in Australia and we came up with this idea that, you know what, we, like, all these books are recommended by him. I read these books and I'm like, you know what, we need to Islamify these books. Because there's such amazing content in these books, but unfortunately such, some of it is so haram that, you know, I wouldn't want the Muslim audience to read it. So the plan is, Baba Ali and myself, we are working on something right now. It's just about tawfiq from Allah, when will it finish? In terms of other works that are available, there's nothing complete and concise. So in the Arabic language, Ibn Hazm has written a lot about love. Ibn Al-Qayyim has written a, a lot about love. But in terms of the uh, husband-wife dynamic, that's not what it actually addresses. That's not what it actually addresses. So I'm on, uh, I don't know of anything in Arabic. And in English, there's nothing from the Islam perspective at all. Not even about dealing with love. So it's something that definitely needs to be done. And we pray for Allah's tawfiq in that. Jazakallah khair. Go ahead. The first joke I told you. A man who was driving by a bar, they got to a point. Yes, 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 yes. What about it? Uh, I forgot how much one. <laughs> you forgot the punchline. Okay, khalas. I'll share the joke with you. Actually, here's another thing that you learn. There's like another thing that, you know, there's two types of five minutes that a man and a woman share. There are two types of five minutes that a man and a woman share. And that is when a woman says, honey, I will be ready in five minutes. 
And when the man says, honey, I will be home in five minutes. Those, that's not actually a joke, it's actually factual. <laughs> so you can laugh if you want, but that's factual. That when a man says, I'll be home in five minutes, this is the equivalent of a wife saying, honey, I will be ready in five minutes. Both of them will never be five minutes. It's going to be much, much longer than that. But the, the joke the brother was referring to, I use this joke quite a bit, that's why I didn't want to use it today. And that is, a husband and wife, they've just started on the trip. And as this trip starts, they get into like a humongous fight, a gigantic fight, and there's a lot of tension on this trip now. So as they're driving along, the husband, he feels bad, and he's like, you know, let me break the ice with my wife. So he sees this tree, and he starts saying, honey, isn't this tree so beautiful? The leaves are so green, the tree is so tall. And the wife's like, just shut up and drive. <laughs> now time goes on, and the husband's like, you know what? She just like really hurt my feelings, man. I need to get back at her. So they're driving by a barn, and you hear the braying of a donkey, the barking of a, do of a dog, the mowing of a cow. So the husband goes this time, honey, let me guess, they're relatives of yours. And the wife's like, you're right, they're my in-laws. <laughs> That's the punchline. <laughs> Go ahead. Is family planning allowed in Islam? Excellent, is family planning allowed in Islam? So there's a haram aspect and a halal aspect to this. The haram aspect of this uh, considers two things. So family planning is haram with two considerations. Number one, that it is done out of fear of poverty. So if, per, if a husband and wife decide that, you know what, we're not going to have any children because we can't afford to have children, from an Islamic perspective, this is not allowed because Allah reiterates in the Quran time and time again that we are the ones that will provide for you. So doing it out of poverty is not allowed. Number two is that if it is harmful to uh, one of the spouses, then in that situation, family planning is not allowed as well. Let me explain that. So the general rule on contraception, and I'll frame it this way, this is much easier to understand. The general rule on contraception is that contraception is allowed with three conditions. Contraception is allowed with three conditions. Number one, it's not done out of poverty. Number two, is that the type of contraception, oh sorry, number two, is that the permission of both spouses is there. So the permission of both spouses is there. And number three, the type of contraception that is used is not harmful to either of the spouses. Not harmful to either of the spouses. So you'll notice that the most common type of contraception that we have in our time is what they call the pill. And what happens with this pill is that it uh, delays uh, and postpones a woman's menstrual cycle. So sometimes she'll have the menstrual cycle, but it'll be very late. And other times she won't have the menstrual cycle at all. Now from a physiological perspective, this has two negative repercussions. One, it's against the natural state that she was created in and is very abnormal for her body. And number two is that it comes with a whole bunch of hormonal side effects. So she'll get angry very easily, happy very easily, cry for no reason sometimes. All of these things will happen due to the pill. So the pill, in fact, while it is the most common and most popular, it's not the most safe. It is not the most safe because of the side effects that it comes with. So what a husband and wife will want to do is speak to their doctor and see what is the best solution for them. And, you know, as long as it's not permanent, then bithillahi ta'ala, the contraception is halal and it's not a problem. And that is based upon the hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu, found in Sahih al-Bukhari, where he said, we used to practice al-azal while the Qur'an was being revealed. The act of al-azal is to withdraw before climax so that no pregnancy would take place. And this was during the Qur'an being revealed and the Qur'an did not come and prohibit it. And based upon that, it would be allowed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Question number four. Go ahead. Who are the authors? Who are the authors of the books? You're a bit young to ask, aren't you? <laughs> but it's good, you want to learn. So the five languages of love is by Gary Chapman. The seven principles of making a marriage work is by Dr. John Gottman. And then you have the three series over here, which are by Alan and Barbara Peace. So remember the word please, but without the L. So peace is the word please without the L. Those are the authors of the books. Last question, Billahi Ta'ala. Or forever hold your peace. Going once. Excellent. Tawadda Lakhi. Alaykum as salam wa barakatuh. Sorry, just one second. Guys, please be respectful. When someone's talking, let them ask you a question. Go ahead, Lakhi. Why can't you use contraception if it's going to use? Sorry, I, I, how I understood it was like, if one of the spouses is in danger, then you can't use 
okay, that, I, this is what I was afraid of, and I'm really glad that you asked this. So for example, in certain cases, and I'll explain what I meant by this, is that the general case is that if contraception is harmful, that the contraception within of itself is harmful, then, then you can't use the contraception. That is what I meant by saying. However, if there's a circumstance where, you know, if a woman has another child, then, you know, it may end her life or it'll be extremely, excruciatingly, you know, painful for her. Then in such a case, using contraception would actually become wajib in such a situation. So what I was saying was that using contraception is something which in its asal, in its origin and foundation is permissible with these three conditions. That it's, uh, um, it is not done out of fear of poverty, that it is not harmful. The actual contraception within of itself is not harmful to the spouse. And number three is that it's done with consent from both spouses. That is what I was trying to say. Excellent. Good question though. Jazakallah khair. Last question. It's really yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Good question. So the brother's question is that a husband and wife are using contraception and no contraception is 100% foolproof. So the, the wife ends up conceiving at this time. Is she allowed getting an abortion or not? And the answer to this is that abortion at all times is haram. The general case scenario in abortion is that it is haram at all times. Now, there are two stages of the fetus. One before the soul is induced into it and one when the soul is not induced into it. When the soul is not induced into it, the scholars have said it is still a sin. However, it doesn't reach the level of murder. It does not reach the level of murder. And after 120 days, when the soul is induced inside to the baby, then at this stage, if abortion was to take place, it is equivalent to murder. And all the prerequisites of murder need to take place at that time. All the prerequisites of murder need to take place at that time. In terms of blood money, in terms of janazah, in terms of all of that, it needs to take place at that time. So before that, it is haram and it is impermissible. After that, it becomes a major sin that you know, has the, the prerequisites of, law, of, of uh, murder. Wallahu alam. I said last questions, but go ahead. Last two and then we finish, go ahead. So just regarding this, this question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I heard that uh, the father is in killed for killing his son, right? That's not applicable to him. Okay. So how does that tie in this case? Okay, you're getting into a completely different realm of fiqh <laughs> that we're not going to address. <laughs> is, there, is there a second question? Yeah, about Sheikh Jamal Zarabozo when explaining this hadith. Says after 40 days or 120 days, I don't know. Yeah, so in terms of when is the soul induced inside the baby, the vast the hadith is narrated by Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and the hadith, according to the vast majority of narrators, it says 120 days. However, one of the narrators, he didn't narrate it as 120 days, he said 40 days. Now the scholars of hadith, they differed over here. What is the correct version of this hadith? Is it 120 days, which is the most popular opinion, or is it actual 40 days? And if you look according to you know, medical science, any collaboration with hadith, it seems that the 40 days is more accurate over here and not the common version of the hadith that says 120 days. But this is, you know, we'll discuss it more at the time of the hadith class. But it's a difference of opinion that you should be made aware of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Go ahead. Uh, you were saying uh, after the soul is broken, yeah. uh, uh, after the fetus, and you take an abortion, you die, and the prerogatives of blood money, and uh, that's when the money falls into place. So, who do you pay the blood money to? Your husband? Or that's a good question. We'll discuss it when we get to that time. <laughs> I just want to emphasize that it is considered murder at that time. Abortion after the soul has been induced into the baby is officially considered murder at that time and is a, a kabira min al-kabar, is a major sin from the major sins in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We'll end with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.